allergies. They're nothing to sneeze at. Tonight, On Call. Funding for On Call Television is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. We've been waiting anxiously for spring to get here, but along with the warmer weather come new bouts with allergies. They're nothing to sneeze at when the doctors are on call tonight. Allergies, allergies, something's living on my skin. <laughs> Hello and welcome to On Call Television. And this is going to be a special night, oh, I can tell it already. <laughs> the history uh, of the field of allergy and immunology began late uh, compared to other medical disciplines. It was in the 1900s, early 1900s, when a Viennese pediatrician noted patients with strange reactions to dust, pollen, and certain foods. Named after the Greek words allos, meaning other, and ergon, meaning work, this new specialty in medicine has developed since picking up the necessary understanding of immunology along the way. General internists, pediatricians, and family physicians have to have a good general understanding of this field as we see allergy and immune problems in so many of our patients. Allergic reactions to proteins like poison ivy, peanuts, and cat dander can result in blisters, hives, sneezing, and even reflux, bloating, and diarrhea. Immune compromised states can happen because of medications like steroids, chemotherapy, even antibiotics, as well as conditions like lupus, transplantation, and even just advancing age. And then there comes the time when we need the expertise of an allergist. Tonight we have the true pleasure of having superb allergist immunologist doctors, Dr. Mark Bubach and Dom Luzier, thank you both for joining us. You're welcome. Welcome. We're both, here. You've we're, been here before. We, yes. Yeah, exactly. And both of you are significant don uh, supporters of our show, and your your uh, your clinics are named in the back. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for doing this. This is doing it every week. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. So tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you come from? What got you into this field? Where did you train? A little bit. About you. I'm a native of South Dakota. I uh, grew up here, did my medical school in state, and trained at Mayo and uh, practiced there. But I just love South Dakota and had to come back. Now, you were an internist and then you became an allergist? Allergist, right. Uh, if you're going to be an allergist, you have to either become a pediatrician like Tom, Tom <laughs> and, or an internist like me, and then you do a couple extra years uh, of fellowship afterwards. And, Allergy is exciting. Uh, we're actually the first subspecialty that that came out of medicine, and we're unique because it's both pediatrics and adults that you're certified in. Okay. And Tom, yours yours, yours is a pediatrics uh, beginning, but let's right. talk about where you came from. Well, uh, mine's more circuitous than circuitous. Yes. 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 I thought I used that. that that's today. a good word. Exactly. Thank you very much. Um, I, I grew up in Kansas City. I went uh, into the military because that's what you did in that in the years in the, in the 70s. And so I trained at Fitzsimmons in pediatrics. I would actually started out in OBGYN, but I liked the moms and the babies, and, and so I got both of those. And I did that uh, in the military for about six years and then uh, had the opportunity to uh, take a fellowship at uh, University of Kansas, which was the 
adult side and at Children's Mercy, which was the, the uh, pediatric side. So um, allergists who are pediatricians train some internal medicine. So yeah. we would kind of go back and, and do some internal medicine because um, allergists take care of adults and pediatric patients, regardless of what our background is. Yes. So we, we come back and do that. Um, and then uh, certified in allergy in uh, 1981, so that dates me right there. Yep. And, uh, and it, the, this practice of allergy is a blast. It, you know, you have to be a botanist, you have to be an animal husbandry person, you yeah. have to know about environments, you have to know about mold, and it's, it's an exciting subspecialty, and it's, you're a detective, and you get to be a detective. The system still supports you sitting down with the patient and doing detective work, so that's why we do what we do. That's really great. What about immunology in this? Now, I, I, I said uh, you are immunologists in a sense that you have to know the immune system. Allergy is really totally tied to the immune system, but are you, are, is there a field of immunology that's separate from what you do? Mark? Uh, yeah, every uh, field of medicine actually is getting tied into immunology. We do certain parts. Uh, the, the allergy part is immunoglobulins. We, are, we have some immune deficiency states. Uh, but, you know, the rheumatologists do things. We're finding out the immune system has a lot to do with cardiac uh, disease. Uh, so it's hard to separate out any one organ, but we need to know a lot about it. Yeah, and, uh, and indeed you do, and we'll get into that. Before we get any deeper into the sneezing and water your eyes and the hives, we invited you to call, we invite you in to call our questions, your questions at 1-888-376-6225. That's 1-888-376-6225 or visit us on calltelevision.com and click on the email a question button. So we need your questions. This ought to be a great opportunity for you to get some really important and free advice. This is a real important timing. Very quickly, we're gonna go to uh, uh, something shortly, but I wanna talk about the timing of it is, is our allergies starting right now? Correct. At like right now? Right now. The, this is tree allergy time, right? Correct, and it, it was high very high yesterday. Really? Yes. Because of... Even in Aberdeen, who's much farther north than, than this. But uh, and why, why is it... What, what, they're not even opening. Well, no, that's... You're not look for the opening that's it's a little... The pollen comes cans. early. Oh, really? And that's they don't... has been three weeks or so. Yeah. And they don't really started. care. They don't really care about temperature or anything. It's length of day. That's oh, really? how they did... That's how the trees figure it out. So the catkins, the little things that hang down, so the trees get kind of this brown, shadowy look to them. That's the pollen. The brown, the, the brown, say that again, the that brown. brown. If you look at a tree, it's, it, it's stark during the winter, and then it gets kind of this little fuzzy, shit. that's the pollen. That is. Right. And so uh, we're going to have tree allergy now starting three weeks ago, right, right. now, actually. Right now, actually. And, and molds. The molds Absolutely. are out, too. The molds are out. They yeah. were under the snow. Belts. Here now we go. they're blowing around, and South Dakota's good for blowing. Oh, and I, it, it, it's real good for blowing. <laughs> Today we're out uh, uh, raking. My wife is sneezing her head off, and I'm going, it's mask. allergy. Mask. You're going mask. I didn't dear. say mask. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but she was sneezing, and I'm going, allergy, That's dear. That's free advice. She, yeah, there it was. <laughs> allergy. She says, no, uh, it's too early. It's not too early. And, of course, now you get outside on a beautiful day and you rake leaves and throw everything in the air and the molds in particular. And that's well, it. and, you know, the hay that our, all of our feeding cattle, that's been sitting all winter, smoldering and that kind smoldering of thing. So and they, moldering. And, and moldering. So when they break them open now and grind them, there's a lot more mold in them now than there was when it was fresh. Oh, wow. So th this is mold and tree allergy t and mold and tree allergy time. Yep. yep. All right. So we'll get into that more, but let's do this. The Centers for Disease Control say that one in 12 adults suffer from asthma, and the National Institute of Health report that asthma and food allergies may often coexist. It can be difficult to determine which causes which symptom and how to control each issue they cause. I can remember back as far as probably when I was three when allergies started bothering me, uh, I had a hard time breathing, um, I'm the, probably the first real time I remember is when I was at a thrashing bee and I just remember I couldn't breathe. My parents started getting me checked probably, you know, four and five years old. I, I was diagnosed with asthma. 
when I think back to school, I, the hardest thing for me is I'd come back, I'd come back to class from going outside before I had things better under control. I couldn't breathe, and I and it actually set me back in school because when you're sitting there and you can't and you don't feel good, it's hard to pay attention in class. So that that was getting past that point in grade school, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're behind in school because you just didn't feel good. I carry an inhaler with me here all the time. I probably use it once a day. Like now, if I'm gonna play a sport, I'll just take it before I play. It's just a lot easier. I was tested for soy in fourth grade. Um, I did go to an allergy specialist, um, and I, all of a sudden I started cutting out, I started reading labels in fourth grade, and that was, you know, that's back in, you know, in the late 70s, and that's kind of something Maybe I, I thought it was new at the time, so all of a sudden I'm reading every label and it has soy in it. All of a sudden I can't start eating these foods, but I started feeling better and I started losing weight, so that was a great thing for me. I have not been checked for celiac yet. Um, that's something I need to do. My son has been diagnosed with celiac, so I need to go in and get checked now. It's important that I do that to find out. Because maybe I don't know how my body, if I am, I don't know how my body's adjusted to that. I don't, maybe I don't know how, Maybe I don't know what it's like to feel really good, and I just have, my body, I've just accepted how I feel now, so it's something I need to go get checked, so. Food-wise, though, I think keeping your weight in check helps a lot for allergies, because, you know, the more weight you have on there, the harder it is to breathe. Well, call in your questions about asthma and allergies at 1-888-376-6225 or email us at questions at oncalltelevision.com. Well, today we have the pleasure of Ellen, the daughter of Dr. Bubak, uh, here to be our guinea pig and illustrate <laughs> to you what about allergy testing. Now, let t tell us a little bit about what we're going to be doing, Mark. We're going to be doing a prick allergy test. Uh, we, we, I've cleaned off the arm with a little uh, alcohol, and then we take the little prick device, it's called a multi-test, and it pushes on the skin for about a second, leaves the little drops, and then a 15-minute timer starts clicking off. There we go. And then we kind of just mark so that I know where things are. There we go. And what we'll do is we'll have her come back in about 15 minutes and find out what's happening. So how many things you've tested? Let's see. Uh, there are, there's always a positive and a negative uh, control, so yes. we know what, what things are supposed to look like. And then we have 14 allergens, and uh, there's a number of things here, the ragweed and some trees, grasses, uh, dust mites, things like that. And uh, we'll find out what she has in just a few minutes here. We can. Continue on. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ellen. <laughs> Just don't okay. touch that. <laughs> yep. Don't touch okay. that don't, pile. And don't rub your eyes with it. And <laughs> that's great. So th 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 that, that's called, there, there's a several prick, different... Prick skin tests. Right. As opposed to intradermal, where we take a little needle and inject, inject it just under the skin. Okay. And yeah. then there's patch tests. That's, patch testing is for eczema. It would be like poison ivy type of tests. Okay. And then there's serum tests that you could use. You don't even need to do these things because you just draw blood, right? Is you that could, you better? Could do, you could draw blood. Uh, they're typically an immunocap is what they're called now. And they're a little bit less uh, able to pick up your allergies than the skin tests are. And they're someplace between two and four times the cost. So they're two to four times the cost and not quite as sensitive. Correct, not quite as good. But because they're really nice. You don't have to worry about drugs that the person's on or if they have skin conditions. I mean, the, the interesting thing is you're measuring two different things. You know, one is you're measuring this antibody in the blood called IgE specific for that particular allergen. Like cat has its own, oak pollen has its own, every one's their own. You make one specific for each one. <coughs> and with the test that Mark just did, it's a biologic test, meaning it actually measures what's happening in your body. You're putting, you're challenging those cells. And that message has gotten from your nose where you got sensitized through your body and onto the cells that are called mast cells 
uh, that are in your arm or back, which is where we do the testing. Right. Typically, we do the testing on the back, but for demonstration, we're doing it on the on right. the arm. Right. Uh, you you gave a lecture, I bet, 15 years ago <coughs> in the Brookings Hospital, and of course you RAS test or or you prick tested everybody in the audience for four things or something, and I and one was cat, and one was dog, and one was uh, a bug bug poop. Um, dust mites. Dust mites, yeah. yeah. And I was terrible, <laughs> terribly allergic to, to all of them, but particularly to the cat. I mean, it was just do not have a cat. And so when our daughter really kind of wanted a cat, I, I said, I, I blame Dr. Bubak. <laughs> yes, it's Dr. Bubak's fault. We can fix that. Yeah. Oh, no, nah, that's all right. <laughs> we can fix those. So we've got some questions. Here's from Madison, South Dakota. Do, do allergies in the sinus affect stomach, like acid reflux? I'll take that. Yeah, yeah. I'll take it. Question one. No, the answer is yes, and we just had a discussion about this between questions. That is, is if you are eating things that you're either, now if you're allergic to it, typically you eat it, you know you're allergic to it because it releases histamine. So I itch, my throat closes, and it happens in the first 30 minutes. We do have foods we don't, tolerate, we call that food intolerance, which because the treatment's the same, avoid the food, it does cause reflux, and reflux is something that can cause asthma and can contribute to sinus disease. So yes, yeah. that's kind of an indirect, food causes a problem indirectly in this gentleman here, right. where you're starting to get pulmonary symptoms when you eat, you definitely would see us, because Th then you're working your way to a more systemic reaction, which systemic meaning all over the body. all over the body. You get this thing called anaphylaxis, and death. you get real sick. And yeah, well, hopefully you don't. And the die. other thing, though, with reflux, the, if a uh, food's involved, <coughs> sometimes it's more the eosinophilic esophagitis patients, right. also. But uh, you know, so there's various ways. So uh, let's. So we're talking food allergies, and you're you're, you're discussing eosinophilic esophagitis, mm -hmm. which is really a, a more frequently made diagnosis than years ago there is a food cause for the most part, right? I mean, you find a food, you eliminate the six or eight major foods and then you bring them back slowly and then you see how they do. Is that what you, how you I, normally I think, treat I them? think in kids it's higher than that. It's probably 90 plus percent there's gonna be a food that, or foods, plural, that are uh, etiologic. In adults though, it's probably more two thirds. So it's, it's... And it's maybe not always allergic, but it, somehow the food still plays a role even if the tests don't show it. Right. So it's interesting that, uh, so, but there's skin patch tests for that, right? There's, there's the pricks, prick test plus patch tests that right. can be done. And, and, and Mark and I have done a lot of these and the patch tests, if they're positive, man, they're helpful because that is something that we're probably not gonna put back in the diet quickly. Um, but generally speaking, we've taken the, you know, this is a newly diagnosed disease. It's kind of in its infancy, so um, everything we say here uh, may be changed next year. Um, but typically, these people come in and they feel the food sticking, chicken and bread, because the eosinophils has thickened the lower part of the esophagus so it doesn't work as well. So when we take the foods away, that reactivity disappears because it's not getting that exposure. I didn't say it caused the problem because we don't know what causes the problem. So that makes it a bit mysterious. But if you eliminate the food, it seems to get better. Exactly. And if you can find a specific food, like dairy and wheat being higher on the, uh, on the scale, that's great. If you live in Japan, it's fish because that's what they have in their diet. So it's things that you're commonly eating. Well, that's a strange deal. But um, yes, you eliminate the foods, it works well. And then there's this borderline. Remember that if you're having the biopsy and then there's 20 eosinophils, not 100, not real intense, reflux also causes an eosinophilic reaction. So, so how much, it, which, which is the cart, which is for, oh, yeah. so it, it's a very interesting problem. Fortunately, our treatment is, is good. It seems to put them into remission and only about, what, about 20% come back if you reintroduce the wrong food. I food, mean the food that the food. was the problem in the first well, place. I think that it's a lifelong disease. If you've got eosinophilic esophagitis, you're going to be dealing with it for decades. Uh, you add the food back that was that caused it, it's going to come back. That's why we, you remember the food drops we've talked about before? If, if you're allergic to a food and you want to desensitize, like to milk, 
how many of those people are going to develop eosinophilic esophagitis because you're desensitizing them They're up here? Are you influencing are you it? Right. Well, and I don't think all the I don't I don't think all the uh, um, the judgment is not in yet. Yeah, I mean, isn't it amazing how here we are so sophisticated in healthcare, and yet in particular allergy, th there's so much we don't know. Well, it's kind of fun once you learn something, then you realize you don't know something else, and it just leads to more discoveries. There it goes. Better care for patients. Yeah, so we learn uh, a little bit more. So the classic esophagitis, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, is food catching. Sticking, and even sometimes the surgeons will refer the ones that they have to take the food out yep. because they, it didn't go down at all. And then it's also the heartburn that you're on the really good acid suppressors like the omeprazole at double doses, and you're still having heartburn. Yep. A bunch of those are also eosinophilic so esophagitis. And but now it presents differently though in little kids. And how early can little kids get this? Very young. Very young. And, and, and babies. Th babies, yes, right. And, and they re regurgitate. They regurgitate. They throw up. And they don't right. grow. Right, because they're not getting them quite the nutrition. And, and if it doesn't get them there, they have another one that affects the lower part of their um, intestinal tract. So their intestinal tract is just forming and forming its immunity. So they're a lot more sensitive. and, and uh, Now, there's a bunch of theories of why it, 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 it's happening. And we don't know, though, do we? Correct. But the theory is, right, that it's the timing of the milk that's introduced, or it's the timing of the food that it's introduced, or it's the, or it's too much or too little, or what the mother was doing, or who knows? You're not going to get any answer out of either <laughs> one of us. We we kind of talked about this, and we were like, oh, dude, you can't, you can't we're not going to go there right. because we really don't know. The, uh, just to give you an example of how much we don't know, originally we said. Mothers avoid peanuts, milk, egg, and that kind, and your child will be less allergic. And that was actually in the pediatric literature as a um, as a, as a uh, something they published. Yeah. Right. Avoid as these a, things. That's what we used to say. Yeah. Practice, now we're saying practice parameter. Right. And they made a and they took it out because the the information just didn't now you correlate. Start all, all the foods at four months. Right. Yeah. It used to be six months for solids and then at 12 months and then they changed it. It was four and then it went to six and now it's back to four. But still breastfeeding is the best. Breastfeeding is very important. Correct, mm -hmm. because it, those kids do better. Vaginal deliveries and, uh, and breastfeeding. When you can. It's also yeah. nice to have the C-section when you can do it anyway. Well, yeah. Yeah. When you need it. And good, good supplement and when you can't mm -hmm. breastfeed. Yeah. Uh, we ask about sinuses, though. Let me ask you about sinus effect. Um, oh, we did. We talked that. Sioux Falls. What age should you bring your child to an allergist? I think that the age to see an allergist is when they're having allergy problems that are difficult to control, and we're wondering what to avoid, or uh, are they ready for uh, becoming less allergic? So. Uh, we see people at all ages. So, but what would be the, the common symptom that people have that are allergic that they may not know they're having an allergy? The, it, you know, there's kind of a spectrum. Babies have GI disease, right. primarily. So allergy, primary disease. So they, that, that they come to my office as very under a year with GI issues, gastrointestinal, stomach and intestinal. Could this issues. be an allergic problem? Correct. They ask, and you say not not much runny nose. That that comes on later. Right. The asthma portion in babies is usually not allergic, but obviously the allergist takes care of a lot of asthmatic children, and but the allergic asthmatic child comes later. So the inhalant yeah, allergy takes longer to to come. So. We see the younger kids primarily for food-related yes. kinds yes. of things, although and, we'll see them for cats awful, and dogs well, sometimes. An awful lot of atopic dermatitis, the rash yeah, and the, yeah. uh, uh, the different areas, and uh, then the cough and wheezing stuff. So it, it looks like we're about 15 minutes, and we've okay. got a, 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 uh, our volunteer to indicate some things on her arms. So let's bring it up to the, and let's bring the camera in and let's see how you're doing, Ellen. All right. Well, what we see, uh, I don't know if this is showing up pretty well or not. Not uh, yet. Not yet, okay. Here it is, yeah. now it is, oh my gosh. Okay, so what we do, there's, uh, it's called a wheel and a flare. A person does some measurements 
uh, how wide across does this welt or the wheel? And here we have nine millimeters, then how big's the redness? By 20, and we measure each of these and then uh, compare it to the histamine and a person sees what all each of it is. Now this does itch, right? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> and you can so with the histamine, you, you injected one that you knew is your that'd control. Be down here, this yeah. guy right there. Histamine is actually yeah. there, yeah. And then the rest of it is her histamine, releasing so, as a result. There we go. And so uh, on here we've got two dust mites. And up here we have the molds and cats. So now which ones is the big reaction that we're seeing there? These, these are the dust mites. Now you can imagine that you get the dust mite stuff blowing up your nose, you, you breathe that in, or the cat, and that same swelling is happening inside your nose or in your eyes, and no wonder it causes you to be uncomfortable. Well, thanks for, for letting us use your arm, yeah, Ellen. Not, thank you very much, Ellen. What, uh, what are you going to do for her now? Because she's going to have an itchy arm, Mark. I think she's going to be cleaning. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, actually, the, uh, actually the, uh, the, the, these itchy spots in about 15 minutes will pretty much so be uh, not itching anymore. By an hour, they're completely gone. You don't need to treat person. It, it's really a quite simple, short-term little test. And safe test. Uh, yep, uh, you're not going to go into anaphylaxis from, from that test. So I've had one experience with anaphylaxis. Uh, a gentleman had, I was the attending at, at Grady Hospital. A gentleman had received a shot of penicillin by the intern who, for a sore throat. Uh, and Old school. Old school. The guy was sitting out in the hallway waiting to, or, you know, in the waiting room, waiting to for an hour before he could go home. And he knocked on the door and says, I'm not feeling very well. And by the time the nurse got me uh, and the, the emergency cart, he was sitting on the floor kind of just barely there, you know, and, uh, and then he sort of passed out mm -hmm. and leaned, leaned forward. And then he, he it apparently when he leaned forward, he got his, um, his blood pressure back for a little ways. And, uh, and so he woke up. And so he sat up, and you could just see the water, just like it was draining from the tub <laughs> going <laughs> down. There was no blood pressure. And anaphylaxis, you know, with the uh, itchy, but the low blood pressure, can't breathe. It can be frightening. I, I think this is a great time to point out that, uh, you know, that there's been a national move in South Dakota legislature, and uh, uh, Governor Dugard passed a nice school epinephrine pen law this year so that if uh, someone for the first time has anaphylaxis at school, which oftentimes that's the first time that they uh, it's identified, there's actually going to be epinephrine available so the school nurse can jump in and uh, intervene. So I, I, I can't say it uh, loud enough. If you have a risk for this type of a thing, get an EpiPen or one of the alternatives, the Al generic. LVQ is the other brand. What is it called? LVQ. LVQ. Mm -hmm. So one of those, and is there a preference? Do you guys have a preference for no, either we one? we just want them to have epinephrine Something. available. That's right. So and and if I, oh, I don't know if I should take a shot or not. I'm worried. I think I am. I'm kind of getting short of breath. Then you should breath. take it. There's no reason not to take it. No, none. Take, take it. Take it. Yep. Get the shot. Get it available. Don't hesitate to use it. Save a life. I have a, uh, uh, here's a question. Are allergy shots effective? Allergy. Well, go ahead. Oh, allergy. allergy shots have been around since, uh, for 102 years. Uh, pollen allergy was initially reported as helpful. Uh, it's a lot simpler to do shots nowadays. Uh, it ends up being about a five year course and uh, people, so someplace between a 60 and 70% reduction in symptoms is common. Uh, Boy, it's, it's wonderful to decrease the amount of meds you need, how miserable you are, so they're and quite helpful. If you've ever been to the emergency room one time for an allergic process, it pays, it would have been paid for had you, had you uh, done your allergy shots. Right. It's, it's a, you know, the, the problem with immunotherapy, and, and I underwent immunotherapy when I was in the military, is the time, the, the time you know, you have to set aside a time to get desensitize that's the first year of what we do and then we want to develop tolerance which is a much more permanent that's what the longer course does for us and it's just so much more effective than all the other 
modalities. We've got some great modalities. We just have an oral grass pollen, FDA approved. I like to stick with stuff that's approved by the FDA, that it's not uh, uh, the drops, although they've been shown to work. Uh, Mark and I kind of go back and forth with this because we've decided sometimes, yeah, we'll, we'll do drops because of convenience, and then we say, but gee, it's only 30% effective. You know, right. we need to try to m morph those people into getting that shot, that, that shot works. and that, that works and gives you a long term. I mean, sometimes I, I don't see a patient ever again. They'll stop and see them in the grocery store because yeah. they, they are relieved they're not of relieved symptoms. of their symptoms. They still use antihistamine, and if they do something like, you know, mow the lawn in the middle of peak pollen season, well, they're going to have a problem if they didn't wear a mask, that kind of thing. You know, the thing to point out, too, is that allergies are going to be your whole life. I mean, people, after decades and decades, things are better, but a lot of people, it's just because we get inside jobs and hobbies, and we're not exposed to those things. Yeah. And so if you could become less allergic, it's great. Allergy shots, uh, we have about 70% of people successfully complete a course. The drops or the sublingual tablets in Europe where they've been done, only 17% of people cr uh, complete, complete a course. Complete their course. And so, you know, we hope to get that better when they're here and uh, in practice, but boy, people have to stick to things for a while. It's the same with the nose sprays or your allergy pills and avoidances. Okay. I've got a call from Alice uh, Alcester, and of course, this is uh, one of my comments. Is Sudafed good for allergies? How often should uh, he take it? Should it be started early in the season before allergies get bad? I'm not a fan of Sudafed. I know you guys prescribe a fair amount, but it's the Sudafedrin. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a stimulant, and it's a decongestant. It dries you out, but then you have rebound, and so you have to keep taking it. So what's your comment? Sudafed can be used as needed. It kicks in. If you've got a four-hour pill, it helps you for four hours. It kicks in right away, then it's done. Uh, you don't, there's no buildup. There's no additional benefit by taking it Regularly. routinely. Just use it as needed for plugged. It only helps plugged. It doesn't help runny or itchy or sneezy, it's for plugged. And the other thing is, is that if you use it for any period of time, it does raise your blood pressure. You know, it is the basis for methamphetamine. methamphetamine. I mean, <laughs> give me a break here. So it does stimulate you, so you better not take it just before you go to bed, unless of course you don't want to sleep, then maybe that's yeah, a good thing to go. do. And it, then it rebounds. Yeah. You, you, but you don't take you it. think that a better route would be the nasal steroids, and like the new Nasacort? The oh. nasal steroid is better, and the, it used to be all prescription, just came over the counter. Hooray! And it's going to, the price must be coming down. Then. Oh, wow. Yeah. Fabulous news. Instead over of the counter steroid. Instead of 120 bucks a month, it's 19.99. Not Sudafed, over the counter nasal cort, right? Is that what nasal it is? Steroid. Nasal right. steroid. Right. We all love to eat. Foods can be nourishing and emotionally fulfilling, but sometimes the foods we eat cause our bodies to react in ways that can be uncomfortable and even life-threatening. Food allergies and intolerances are commonly misunderstood. A food intolerance, such as a lactose intolerance, will typically cause minor symptoms such as gastrointestinal discomfort, bloating, sometimes gas, or just belly pain. These symptoms usually resolve within just a few hours. Someone who has an intolerance can typically tolerate small amounts of these foods. However, the symptoms seem to increase when larger amounts of these foods are consumed. Common food intolerances include lactose intolerance, wheat intolerance, and also a corn intolerance. Food allergies are more serious. They actually are an immune response to the food that you consume. The reaction to a food allergy is more serious, including anaphylactic response, troubles breathing, loss of consciousness, or even a swollen tongue. The best treatment for a food allergy is to vo avoid the food altogether. However, some people are able to tolerate very small amounts of a food that they're allergic to. Common food allergens include eggs, wheat, milk, nuts, and also soy. Some allergies can be outgrown, if a child gets it when they're young. However, not all food allergies can be outgrown. If you wonder or question if you or a family member have a food allergy or intolerance, see your local health care provider to get checked out.
Thank you, Katie. Do you have questions about allergens or any kind of allergy problems that we haven't talked about? Call in with that question at 1-888-376-6225 or email us at questions at oncalltelevision.com. So she talked about food allergies. Let's just kind of go on food allergies. She discussed a variety of different things. What are the, the eight most common things that we talked about with eosinophilic? Uh, those are the major food allergies, aren't they? The eight, the top eight, you know, peanuts and milk and wheat and egg and, and seafood tree nuts and, and tree nuts and seafood and fish. Okay. And uh, what is soybean? Mean? Soybean. And they, now and and you know they it, they call it the uh, I love it. They call it the uh, six elimination diet, but they put fish and shellfish as and one. as one and tree nut and peanut, which are completely not related, in the other. So it's really eight. It's eight. So, and those are, are the common, I mean, th are there other foods? Absolutely. I mean, so Every those day you read another case report that says there's another food. So, so we're never, uh, we, we like the eight foods, but we know that there could be other issues. As a matter of fact, occasionally, if we're really stumped, we have to put them on a amino acid diet and then bring foods back again. It's mostly proteins though, isn't it? Is yes, except there is a sugar that's in uh, mammalian meats called alpha-gal, and you can be sensitive to that. How about that? So the there's sugar. That's sugar. Mm -hmm. So there's there's anything and everything, but the common ones are the ones that we've that we just, just listed. Right. So uh, what would be the most common picture of a food allergy? Uh, let's take a p kid. Mostly it's going to be milk at one or two or something like that. A true allergy, right? Oh, oh egg is pretty close. It, whatever the food is, they eat a little bit of it, and within minutes, you start seeing maybe the lips swell up, they get some little hivey things, the voice probably gets a little hoarse, they might be coughing, wheezing. Hopefully, if it's mild, that's all it is. Otherwise, you know, they might be throwing up, diarrhea, along with it, worse hives, hard to breathe. So that's the classic kid, and it could be uh, any the kids, the any age. The the kids, fortunately, usually throw up, so it's not sitting in their gastrointestinal tract, continuing oh. to cause a they, problem. They dump so it. absolutely. So um, uh, kids uh, have a lot of local reactivity because they're mast cells are pretty active yeah. up here. I mean, yeah. you can just scratch their skin and get a little mast cell activity. So that's a good thing. And a lot of times the kids just won't eat that food. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, just, they, they know this is bad. This I'm is not bad. Eat this stuff. Mom, don't give me this food. <laughs> you know, trying everything on your plate might not yeah. be the wisest thing to do. So uh, but what about an adult food allergy? Well, those are pretty, they're pretty that's much the same, the same thing. The same thing. And for adults, it's usually the peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish are the vast majority for them. For them. So now, celiac disease, of course, is when it is gluten sensitive and you develop uh, a, a kind of unusual kind of an allergic reaction in the small it's best intestine. It's not to say even it, allergic. It's, right. it's, it's, it's an intolerance. It's an intolerance. It's, it's a bad disease, it can be miserable. But it's not an allergen. Right. No. Okay, so we'd stop saying the word allergy, but we'll say it's something that's inflamed in the small intestine yeah. and malabsorption occurs, they get a secondary milk intolerance, and, but is that, what would you put that to the rest of the food allergies? Totally different. Totally different, because it's an immune, kind of, we, we measure some immune parameters and it gives with some accuracy still the Cadillac is to do a biopsy and show that your GI tract is flattened out and yeah. not absorbing right. and that's and it's hereditary familial right um, and uh, I think sometime we'll with these patterns of genome that we're doing I think eventually we'll be able to Figure make the diagnosis more accurately with the um, genetic test right and of course what you just said it gets pretty furry if you happen to have a parasite also and you have um, an issue with the, now you're not you're malabsorbing so a lot of other things happen right. changes your bacterial uh, flora. presence flora so now you get all that issue so it it goofs up the a largest immune system organ in the body the so, big old intestine so that's not a food allergy really the food allergies in an adult would be the same thing these kind of hives the histamine kind of release hives yeah. asthma low blood pressure all at once and, and perhaps our, and our guest was an example of that. And then nail the, with the epi. Get the epi. Yeah. yeah. All right, what about, uh, oh, let's see. 
What about hives for three years, wants to know if she goes to the Brookings Clinic, could Perfect. she get a patch <laughs> test to help? You come to the Brookings Clinic <laughs> and it, she's had hives for three years. Hives is a very interesting, tell me about hives. I think the, probably a good thing to say about this is that there are actually some new treatments that are available. Awesome. Uh, I'm gonna say that this is chronic hives I'm talking yeah. about. It's not, it's the, the it, this is not, I ate my peanuts, I'm allergic to it, I can't breathe, my throat's swelling up. These people with chronic hives, and we'll call it chronic idiopathic urticaria, they just get hives, it comes and goes whenever, it makes no sense whatsoever. Those folks, almost all of them have an autoimmune disease against the mast cells. It's the receptor that holds the allergy antibody. Uh, there's a lot that's to be done, and one of the big things is we don't do a lot of allergy tests because it's typically not an allergic disease in the classic sense. But high dose antihistamines, sometimes the Montelukas singular is being used, Dapsone is another drug, and something for people to know who've had everything is that Zolaire, it's a shot that typically has been for severe allergic asthma. It's a monoclonal antibody that binds up your allergy antibody has been just a couple of weeks ago approved for the use for chronic hives and it can really be helpful. Yeah. Now the tricky thing is is that you know when something is new it's very hard to get through our insurers so yes. our insurers have multiple <laughs> steps to get through yeah. and you have to be on a kidney transplant drug cyclosporin or um, Celsept or Dapzone so or I think you can do Plaquenil and consider and, and that. really high antihistamines, because Zolaire is expensive. It's about $15,000 a year. Oh, wow. But, it, now, the, all, the, all the characteristics, it really shuts. I mean, mm -hmm. these people are on, they're sleepy from their antihistamine, yeah. H1, H2, Montelicast, and, and the doses they have to have do interfere with their life. So, so do their hives. I mean, you're right. trading one thing for another. And the Zolair, if, if you choose your patient appropriately, I mean, it does take a little choosing, mm -hmm, I think, mm -hmm. just shuts it right down. Now, what is the patient that's not appropriate? It's the one that's got another cause. I've got a chronic sinus infection. My, my teeth are bad. I've got a chronic bladder infection. I have, a, I have H. pylori. I have something stimulating my immune system. Right. That's a different group, but they can have chronic urticaria. So we do a workup really looking for, is there a cause inside of you? Almost never is it external. Right. But it's amazing because uh, it, even as, as short as 10 years ago and all the way back to med school, they had exclusion types of plans. They'd put a person in the hospital and they would take all their clothes away, only the certain sheet. You'd eat uh, nothing, you know, you know? more or less <laughs> chicken and rice yeah. and maybe some carrots and water. And if I didn't say it, you didn't get to eat it. Yeah. Uh, we'd do that, uh, take off all their meds. The workup is completely different nowadays. Um, and we wish we had a little bit better test. There's a, a chronic urticaria test that's available. Unfortunately, the sensitivity or how good is it at picking up the disease is only about 50%. Yeah. But if it's positive, boy, it's really neat. So it tells you what good, it is. But its sensitivity is poor. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, it, and those people respond better to the Zolaire, the cyclosporin type of. Right. And you know, we call a lot of skin rashes hives and they're not. Yeah, so they're, yeah. so there's this whole thing of, of more vasculitic um, uh, hives that are, and vasculitic rashes that are a completely different thing. Right. So it does take, and we have a very good cooperative arrangement with Derm when it comes to hives. Yeah. We, we talk about it a lot because yeah. some of it requires biopsy to make that a diagnosis. It, it, things are changing, once it's again, it's I exciting. see that. Uh, eating causes a tickle in uh, the caller's throat, which causes coughing. Is this an allergy? Well, it's if it's all eating, it it can. W bananas are notorious for causing throat tickle and cough. Okay, because melons and ragweed allergic people can do that. Mm -hmm. But we also have a group of people that when they eat, these are reflux mm -hmm. patients. Yeah. This is all irritated back here from their reflux, chronic reflux. And so when they eat, when they all, any food, anything that passes through that irritated area, 
fields. And then there's the group of people that are on ACE inhibitors. Well, we're back to ACE inhibitors because they have kind of a oh. chronic tickle back there they because of the bradykinin. Yeah, the lysinopril, so the lysinopril, the, yeah. the, yeah. the So whenever a patient comes to me and says, you know, I've got this tickle and I'm eating, I say, do you have that tickle all the time? And of course, they're clearing their throat in front of you 30 times, and you're going, uh, uh, which which ACE inhibitor are you yeah. on? <laughs> and uh, how bad is your reflux? And how, how bad, bad is your reflux? reflux? Yeah, exactly. And you and you can have your ear, your nose, and throat guy look at their vocal cords, and you see all the burned uh, acid, burned uh, vocal cords. And, and of course, then you put them on a meprazole, and it it, 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 it takes pretty high dose. And you know, the kind of the, just the clearing, the mucus, it's trying to just neutralize all that stuff. And pretty soon, they don't even feel like they have acid. It's just all gut draining. And remember, we're not saying they have to have heartburn. That yeah. that the, the throat tickle is as common a symptom of of bona fide reflux as heartburn. So that they are equal, not not restricted. Okay, so throat tickle can really be a problem. A lot of, lot of different things can cause that. Boy, you know, it, why is this so hard? <laughs> <laughs> so here is a caller, 79-year-old person allergic to iodine for 40 years. Do you ever get over an allergy like that? Not the patch test type, no. So I, iodine is, a, is not a protein, it's a chemical. Why would you have an allergy? I think, I think a lot of people who say that they're allergic to the iodine meant that they had re hives or they had shortness of breath flushing with a x-ray procedure is I think what the most people the that iodine that. in yeah. that was what it said and it's not really a true allergy it's an anaphylactoid is the doctor language but it sets off the release of the mast cells and uh, tr if you pre-medicate those folks they can generally tolerate the a procedure if they need to. So what is it's, the pre-medication? The, the dose it's of steroids? steroids. It's, it's a bunch of steroids. H2. And H1, H2 blockade, right. Um, H1 and H2 blockade would be? Zantac and uh, Zyrtec. Yeah. And those Benadryl. folks, though, if you were allergic, truly allergic to the iodine type of stuff, you couldn't have table salt. Right, because it's iodized. Right. But yeah. the iodine that is, th that sometimes that we call is a contact type, which is really not an allergy mechanism, is the other way you can have issues. The people that used to get iodine for cuts and bruises, they have a reaction. So that's a contact reaction. Contact and, and there are a few people who are allergic to shellfish that the iodine, they, they say it's the iodine, but it's not, it's the shellfish. Okay. And, and if you have that radio contrast x-ray procedure stuff, you can typically eat shellfish. It's those are separate issues. They're separate issues. Yeah, you right. could be and the radio contrast dye is way better now than it was right. thirty years ago. It's completely different. It's much much safer. safer. Yes, much safer. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah. it is a good question. Uh, you know, it reminds me of a patient who came to me, a young man, twenty two years of age, worked at the Ram pub. He prepared shellfish, you know, and clean it and his hands were just he says, I don't think I can work with uh, down there anymore yeah. because my hands just go crazy from uh, working on the show. <laughs> yeah. what, you've seen a similar yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. yeah we have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lucky that's all he had. The world that champion potato peeler, peeler can get it from potatoes too. Oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, what about D in the Sudafed or other medications? What does that mean? Which is better Sudafed or Sudafed D? Now that Sudafed's the D. The Sudafed's the D. So, that's so, the same so thing. that Sudafed D would be like saying Sudafed Sudafed. Yeah. <laughs> so what it is is it's Claritin D that yeah. they meant. Right. And it's the, I, I tell them to take the Claritin if you must. Don't, but don't take the Claritin D. I'd what, what Mark said was short-term rhinovirus, I'm stuffed up. Blocked. Uh, blocked. Daytime. Good choice. Okay. Uh, Sioux Falls, please talk about weeds that cause allergies and what allergies. Which weeds and when does the weed season? Do the season now. We're right now in the, in the tree. tree season. Now, no, end, of, end of March. April into May is the main tree season. Right. Very end of uh, May, especially the beginning of June, gets the grass going. Okay. Grasses are horrible in June and July, and they continue on until it freezes down to 26 or so. Okay. Weeds, it's the middle of the later part of July, they start going, and by the beginning of August, they're terrible, and about August 11th down in Sioux Falls, the ragweed goes crazy. It's by the hours of sunlight, uh, so trees, grasses, weeds. And, and what are the typical weeds? The typical weeds are the kinopod group, which is kochia and Russian thistle or tumbleweed. That's the big pollinators uh, here. Ragweed, he just mentioned. Sagebrush is the other one. And really, those are the big pollinators. What are the big tree allergies? 
Well, those are pretty. That we've got box elder maple. We have uh, cottonwood. And remember the cottonwood, when the cotton comes, that's the seed. So that's, that's been that's pollinated grass. a long time that's ago. And, and, that's, and that's got grass pollen grass in it. <laughs> so if I'm allergic to the cotton and the cottonwood, I'm actually allergic to grass pollen, which is that, stuck on the cotton. Okay. <laughs> okay. I knew he wanted to know that. All right. Celiac and skin cancer. Her dermatologist wants her to use a chemo cream. Is this safe with celiac disease? Oh, so they're talking about using... 5-FU or FUDEX for skin cancer, and she has celiac disease, is it safe? I'd ask the dermatologist. And I'd say it's safe. Okay. Right. Is there a hereditary component in allergies? Absolutely. You bet. It runs you familiar. And I mean, it's like And, and it looks like mom's maybe a little more than the dad's. Why is that? that? Don't know. Moms are nicer. Yeah. Moms are nicer? I'm, Moms I'm, are closer to us. Yes. <laughs> we Moms. lived in the mom. Yes, we did. We'll be back right after this. What would you do to save your child's life? Secondhand smoke can kill them any number of ways. So would you stop smoking around them? Would you ask your family and friends not to smoke around them? Would you keep them away from places where people smoke? Of course you would because you can choose. They can't. It takes courage to stand up for your child. But if you don't, who will? He had no complaints like many men who come to my office for an appointment scheduled by their wives. But as I was asking routine questions, he told me that food sometimes catches on the way down. Since this symptom can be an early sign of cancer, I scheduled an EGD to look at his esophagus with a scope. We were both pleased it wasn't cancer, but to find another case of what used to be a very rare disease called esophagi uh, eosinophilic esophagitis surprised me. It was the second time I ran into this in the last few years, and I was aware of a few children in town who had also recently had a diagnosis. It was one of those conditions you hear, you hear about as a med student but you never see, except now we're finding much more of it. And this appears to be happening globally. Eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE, is characterized by an inflammation of the esophagus and the findings under a microscope of many of a special type of white cell called as eosinophil. We've learned this diagnosis can occur in young children to older adults with symptoms of reflux, regurgitation problems, trouble swallowing, and even food catching or getting stuck on the way down. It's interesting how EOE brought specialty groups together. First, the pathologists started seeing more eosinophils on pieces of esophagus biopsied by both pediatric and adult gastroenterologists in patients referred by pediatricians, internists, and family physicians. Since eosinophils can be an indicator of an allergic process, might be, the patients were then sent to an allergist who put it together. We've discovered it's generally related to food allergy or gets better with food allergy uh, treatment. Cow's milk, the most common offender, and is treated by avoidance of the allergenic food or foods, by anti-reflux medicines, and by swallowing a steroid spray that's usually used for asthma. And we're not sure why this formerly rare disease is happening more often now. And currently, there's no accepted theory why EOE is happening more frequently. We generally recommend waiting four months to start babies on solid foods and cow's milk. It used to be six months for solid foods and 12 for cow's milk. Could EOE have something to do with the timing? Different types of food are introduced to babies? What could be the trigger that draws all those eosinophils to the esophagus? What has changed in our environment to make common something that was a rare disease? So we've got like 15, 20 seconds. Take home message, Tom. Well, Mike, the, as I said to you before, I am so happy that the uh, governor approved the EpiPens because that means a lot to children in South Dakota. Wow. Mark. Uh, it's allergy season. There are lots of great therapies that are out there. Uh, just ask for them. Uh, your pharmacist can help out, your primary doc, your allergist. Great. 
This brings us to the end of our show this evening. I sincerely thank our guests and good friends, Dr. Mark Bubak and Dr. Tom Luzier for helping answer our audience questions this evening. As often happens on the show, time ran out and we didn't get to all of your great questions. So to hear our answers to these questions, please join us now on our website at oncalltelevision.com. Click on the After Hours button to view our answers to some of the questions we didn't get to. We'll get get them on, on the web just a few minutes. In this sonnet number 48, William Shakespeare noticed, spring this way, April hath put a spirit of youth in everything. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for on-call television is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Dakota Care, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Dermatology, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, the Orthopedic Institute, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.